I'm Becky Durham. I'm the pastor at Peace Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And Peace has been gathering on Sunday mornings to worship via Zoom. If you are interested in joining us and need that information, I hope that you will reach out to us via our website at peacepcnc.org. And let us know so that we can get that information to you. We would love to welcome you at worship. Today is the seventh Sunday of Eastertide, and we will hear the words of Jesus's great commission. Now, this is a passage that will change us if we believe it. As we prepare to read from the gospel, let us pray. Word of life, breathe on us today and guide us by the words of the gospel. Restore, support, and strengthen us as we seek unity in you. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Listen now for the word of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're on a mission from God. We're 106 miles from Chicago. We have a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. Now, it does not work for me to ask on YouTube if anybody knows what movie this is. So I'm going to assume that many of you are familiar with the 1980 movie, The Blues Brothers. The premise is that Jake and Elwood Blues are also on a mission from God. They're getting the band back together so they can host a benefit concert and save an orphanage. Now, never mind, please do not pay attention that this mission from God basically leaves a slew of wreckage in their wake as they are pursued by the police, by an angry country western band, by a vengeful ex-fiance. This is the stuff of 1980s movies. <laughs> We're on a mission from God. Church. We, too, are on a mission from God, hopefully one with fewer car crashes and chaos, but whatever it brings, it is our mission. And Jesus invites us to the mission here at the end of Matthew's gospel. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter, the final Sunday of the season. This season, we have been encountering the risen Jesus along with his disciples as he appears to them in Luke and in John. Here in Matthew, we have his only post-resurrection appearance. In Matthew, Jesus doesn't show his wounds or eat a meal with his disciples. Matthew leaves those events for the other gospel writers to cover. Here, the disciples meet Jesus on a mountain in their well-traveled region of Galilee, and he commissions them to service. We call this passage the Great Commission. It's Jesus gathering his disciples, giving them a charge and a benediction. I always think it's faithful and good to be curious and to ask questions of scripture. And so this morning, we are going to ask three questions about this passage together. We're going to ask, who is Jesus talking to? What is the mission? And why is it called the Great Commission? Who is Jesus talking to? What is the mission? And why is this passage called the Great Commission? So first up, who is Jesus talking to? Let's read the first part of the passage again. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Judas is no longer with them, so there are only 11 disciples at this point. They follow Jesus' direction, which was given to the women who went to the tomb, seven, recorded seven verses earlier. 
tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me, Jesus says in Matthew 28, 10. Now this week, I'm very struck by this sentence in this passage. When they saw Jesus, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Please note that the way that it is phrased does not make the two action verbs here, worship and doubt, exclusive of each other. I looked at the Greek for this passage, and it's straightforward enough, although I wonder if the simple conjunction that could mean either but or and could be better translated in some of our Bibles. I wonder if it could say, and they worshiped him and some of them doubted. The worshiping and the doubting seem to be happening simultaneously. They are all worshiping Jesus, but within the kneeling and the hand lifting and the words of awe and praise, there are some who are doubtful. What is interesting is this Greek word for doubt, distazo, is only used two times in the New Testament, and both are in Matthew's gospel. The other time that it's used, it's when Jesus reaches his hand out to Peter, who has fallen into the sea after walking on the water. Remember the story. The disciples are in a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And Peter says, me too. And Jesus invites him to come out onto the water with him. And Peter does. He takes a step. He maybe takes three steps. And all of a sudden, he notices the strong wind and the waves. And he's scared. And he begins to sink. And Jesus reaches out and takes his hand and says, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Distazzo. But don't you know that even in his doubt, Peter still worshiped? He had walked on the water with Jesus, the only disciple to step out of the boat. He believed Jesus was who he said he was, but sometimes he looked around at the wind and the waves and he doubted too. They probably all did. Worshiping and doubting are not exclusive of each other. Doing one does not protect or disqualify a disciple of Jesus from the other. Disciples can and will do both. Who is Jesus talking to? Not some holy theologians who now have all the answers and all the certainty about who Jesus is. He's talking to his disciples who are filled with awe and reverence at his presence before them and some of them doubted. Who else is Jesus talking to? Us. Can you imagine yourself on that mountain in Galilee worshiping the risen Christ and maybe also doubting? When Jesus speaks here, we understand that he is speaking to all of his disciples, the ones who have already been called to follow, and the disciples that those disciples will call, and so on, and so on, and so on. Because these disciples, worshipful and doubting, have a mission that they are being activated to fulfill on this mountain. Which brings us to our second question. What is the mission? Verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That's the mission. Go make disciples of all nations. Disciples, in this case, are people who are called to follow Jesus. Now, how do people know that they are called to follow Jesus? Their neighbors tell them about it. This is God's plan for expanding the kingdom. This is God's plan for mission. Go and make disciples, all nations, not just us, Jesus is saying. This gospel is not just for the Jews or the people that we assume that God wants. Go beyond that and carry the good news that Jesus is calling them to follow him. And then what? Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
welcome the people that Jesus is calling to follow into the covenant family of God. The water and the spirit connect new disciples with other disciples in every time and every place. As we worship on Zoom on Sunday, some of us are as far away as Idaho or New York or Nashville or Kentucky or Indiana. What connects us one to another? Our common Lord and our shared baptism. Thanks be to God. We are joined as the family of God by more than the building we've chosen to worship in. We are members belonging one to another of the body of Christ. Baptize the new disciples and connect them to the body, Jesus says. Next, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Once you have them baptized, don't just clap your hands together and rest on your laurels. Way to go. Another one saved and baptized. Mission accomplished. No, there's a whole other part of the mission, the teaching part, the nurturing part. How long does that take? The rest of the time. The rest of what time? All the time that we have left on earth. Think about yourself if you are a disciple who has been baptized. Are you done learning everything that Jesus has commanded? You are not. I am a disciple of Jesus who has been baptized. I am not done learning everything Jesus commanded. There are people who are still teaching me. You are some of them. So we have our mission. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach. Third question, why is this called the Great Commission? Now, according to the dictionary, the word commission as a noun means an instruction, command, mission, or duty given to a group of people. In the case of scripture, the emphasis is on the root word mission. A commission is a mission that is issued and shared by Christ's body. Why is it called a commission? Because we are co-missionaries. Why is it called the Great Commission? Because it comes from Jesus and because he is our co-missionary too. The rest of verse 20, Jesus says, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We see it over and over about Jesus. He does not leave us on our own to figure it out. If he says go, he means go with him. If he sends us out, he's got a bag pack too. Remember, I am with you always is a promise that this is not our mission and we are not on our own. Sometimes we talk about the mission of the church or the church's mission, and that's okay, but it's slightly wrong. The mission we are on is not the church's mission. We're on a mission from God, remember? It's not our mission. It's God's mission. The mission of God has a church, not the other way around. Not the church has a mission. The mission of God has a church. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you share in God's mission. You are a co-missionary with Christ and with one another, and I am too. That's why it's called the Great Commission. You are called to follow as a disciple. You are capable of being one who calls neighbors to follow, to be baptized into Christ's body, and to teach what that means. You are commissioned, a co-missionary of Jesus and a mission partner with God. Will we go? If we do, we won't go alone. Let us pray. God who calls and commissions us, may we be faithful. By your spirit, empower us to make disciples, to invite others to connect to your church, and to teach what you have commanded faithfully. In Jesus, who is with us always, we pray. Amen. May God bless you and keep you this day and always.